Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I am Laura Carfang, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hello, hello, my friends. How are you guys doing? I have such a great podcast lined up for you today. It's been a topic that everyone has been asking about, and I don't think we talk enough about. It is on pelvic health. Not just like the high-level theoretical, what is pelvic health, but we get into literally talking about the vagina, the vulva, lubricants, understanding the difference between lubricants and moisturizers, understanding what happens when you go through an oophorectomy or a hysterectomy, and how we can actually take action now to better our quality of life. I am joined with physical therapist, or she's actually from Canada, so I'm going to refer to her as a physiotherapist, Beth Hoag, who tells us everything we need to know grounded in literature, science, and research. If you're new to Breast Cancer Conversations and survivingbreastcancer.org, I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us and listening today. Please be sure to hop over to survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events. That is where you can find all of our latest and greatest programming from weekly support groups to creative writing, expressive writing, art therapy classes, yoga, meditation, book clubs, so much we have going on. So please go check us out and don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you never miss a beat. And I can tell you that statistically, we know, it depends on the the article that you read, but we know that up to 75% of women who've gone through breast cancer treatments, 75% have at least one or more, have one or more symptom of a term, and we'll talk about it later, uh, associated with menopause. And we know that 50 to 60% of women who've gone through breast cancer treatment have some problem with sexuality or intercourse. Most aren't coming to me first and foremost for pelvic health, but let me tell you, we have, we, we address it at some point because women, a lot of women just don't realize that uh, it's a problem and that it actually can be helped. Welcome to the conversation. It's been a long time coming this chat. Hey, we've tried a few kicks of the can and we're, we finally made it. So I'm a physiotherapist. I work up in Canada. And so you'll hear me say physiotherapist, but for those of you who are tuning in from the States, physical therapist is the term used. It's the same thing. Just to, I'm in Canada, you're in the States. So uh, just for your listeners to understand that. And I have been a physical physiotherapist for over 18 years, I think. Yes, since 2000. Yep, that's crazy. Almost 18 years. And I have been working in cancer rehab for 14, 15 of those years. And um, so I really joined, sort of jumped on the cancer rehab wagon, if you want to call it, long before it really ever was a thing, if you can consider it that. So there weren't any courses that existed. It was uh, it, it was really something that I had to teach myself at that time. And, and the, my, the reason, a lot of the times I get asked, why did I go into this line? And I, I came into it pretty organically. I grew up uh, with a mother who had metastatic breast cancer. She was diagnosed at her, she was the age of 40 and I was 11 at the time. And, um, and so I really grew up, I grew up with a mom, our reality was cancer in our household. And um, when I sort of fast forward, when I got into physio school, quite literally, almost immediately, I realized, oh my gosh, there is so much that my profession could be doing to help men and women going through cancer so much, yet it's not being done. So pretty literally, <laughs> any project I, I had a choice of topic in my in my um, master's degree, I picked cancer and uh, because it was just my area of interest. And it's, it's really, truly a full-fledged passion of mine. Any chance I can get to stand on a soapbox and talk about, about not about the cancer treatments, but about how much control y- you can have over some your symptoms, Um, and how you manage those. And I just don't feel that our medical system does a great job in doing that. We're really good at treating the cancer, but we're really not, we're not fabulous at treating the whole person. And that's really where my, my passion comes in is, uh, is working in that field. And pelvic health is part of it. The more we talk about that, right, the interdisciplinary approach to treating the person, I think is helpful. I remember when I was going through treatment, and I still do, I, I have like all these like doctors in my back pocket, right? So I have the oncologist, I have the um, radiologist, I have perhaps a nutritionist who's helping me with the diet. I'm having 
you know, my primary care who's helping to try coordinate everything. So there's all these silos and everyone is an expert in their given area. And you're absolutely right to treat the cancer. I don't think it was until after I went through all of my active treatment that I actually raised my hand and said, like, I need actually a psychologist and a social Mm -hmm. worker to help me process everything because it was such a heavy um, news to receive that I didn't realize even the type of help that I needed at the time. And then when my path crossed with you, I was like, oh my gosh, physiotherapy, like no one ever talked to me about getting in contact with someone Mm -hmm. in this profession to really help um, not just the pelvic health area either, but I had my full lymph node dissection. Mm -hmm. So like even being able to like raise my arms and to have the mobility if you're having a mastectomy and, you know, just, you know, the whole, yeah, the whole person, I think is the best way to say it, right. There's a Mm -hmm. lot more to me than just the cancer. So Uh, way more than you than just the cancer. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And that stuff really, really, really matters. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, pelvic health is sort of a piece that I sort of just naturally also came into in my cancer rehab world. It really was not on my radar when I started cancer rehab. Really, to me, cancer rehab was getting people moving again, teaching them what's going on in their bodies. And then I discovered mm-hmm. old lymphedema, what I really need to get my, my understanding and certification in that. And then further down the road, um, I, I sort of just these organic conversations with clients and patients about pelvic health work was con- repeatedly coming up. And, uh, and that's what drove me to get my training in pelvic health, because I thought, um, uh, this is just such, such an unmet need in my own clients that, uh, so that's sort of what, what led me down that road. And obviously what we're talking about today. What were some of the questions that your clients were asking or like, what, what made that light bulb go off that you were hearing repeatedly? Probably two things for the most part, a lot, a lot of repeated comments on feeling dry and itchy and uncomfortable. That was definitely a repeating recurring, um, and that sort of relating to their menopause symptoms because of okay. their treatments. And then the other one was pain with intercourse I, or just a total lack of desire, sexual desire. Those would be the two biggies. There's a lot more obviously that can happen, but those are really the two biggies. And and I used to refer my clients out to another pelvic health physio because I've got some great colleagues where I live in practice and they're fabulous. But the, the resounding theme that I was getting from my clients in terms of, I'd always say how it had to go or how's it going was there was a bit of a discomfort because they were surrounded by young moms, new moms, babies. And for some women, that's really triggering because some women can no longer have children because of their treatments. And for other women, they just felt a little bit out of place. They didn't feel, yeah, they just felt out of place. Um, so with that sort of sensitivity in mind, that's what, that's where my light bulb went off and went, okay, you know, I, I think this is definitely training that I can get. And I have, and, and, and these conversations, I just sort of weave in from day one with my clients, even I'd say, even most aren't coming to me first and foremost for pelvic health. But let me tell you, we have, we we address it at some point because women, a lot of women just don't realize that uh, it's a problem and that it actually can be helped. Yeah. I appreciate you creating this, this openness and the safe space for the topic to even come up. So I think a lot of times too, no one wants to address it. They're embarrassed to talk about it. They don't want someone else to know. Like I think about my boyfriend, like, oh my gosh, every time I disclose this, I wonder what his friends are thinking, right? Like, you know, just like crazy things like that. And so it's just, okay, how can we, or it's so private, right? And so you don't want to ever think that something's wrong with you personally. So like, you know, it's not your fault. And so how do you create this space to um, alleviate some of the pain and, you know, kind of get, you know, the moisture back and kind of the elasticity and everything back. Um, so you can have a good quality of life. Absolutely. And it's what I tell women is it's a body part, like every other part of our body. It's no different than an L in, in terms of just concept. It's no different than an, an elbow or a shoulder yet societally, it's this sort of hush hush topic that we tend not to talk about, or that there's a lot of embarrassment about. Um, so I think for me, the key piece is to make it a safe space. And these conversations help too, right? I think the more we talk about this, it just drives me nuts that we don't, the more we can talk about this, the more normal it becomes. Right. And, and I can tell you that statistically, we know it depends on the the article that you read, but we know that up to 75% of women who've gone through breast cancer treatments, 75%. 
have at least one or more, have one or more symptom of a term, and we'll talk about it later, uh, associated with menopause. 75%, that's huge, right? That's the majority of women. And we know that 50 to 60% of women who've gone through breast cancer treatment have some problem with sexuality or intercourse. So those are, those are massive numbers, right? Yet we're not talking about it enough. So it's opportunities like this where we can really start to, to break that conversation open and normalize it. When we're talking about pelvic health, what exactly are we talking about? Like what specific parts of the body are we discussing and what does it all entail? Maybe before we talk about what pelvic health is, we should talk about what the pelvic or the pelvic floor is. So when we're talking about the pelvis, we're talking about the bony structures. So here are your pelvic bones and those pelvic bones are what house the hip joint as well. Okay. And this is your pubic bone in the front and then turn, you can see it from the front here, but if we turn this around at the bottom of your spine is this triangular bone called your sacrum. Okay. So that creates sort of the bony structure of the pelvis. When we're talking about the pelvic floor, so this is the bottom of your pelvis, we're talking about all the structures that sit at the bottom of that bony, bony house, if you will. So the pelvic floor is really can, is like a bit of a bowl. As we, you might hear it termed the pelvic bowl is another reason because it's a bit of a bowing down. But it's, it's three layers effectively of muscles, sort of like a hammock or a bowl that sit at the bottom. And there's also sphincters like our anus that help open and close and control things, as well as connective tissue or fascia. So if we turn just and show you the inside, some, I don't know how great that is here, but you can almost get this bowl effect that you can see the back of the spine, the pubic bone and the bony pelvis. It's really this bowl of muscles that sits at the bottom. Okay. Okay. And what's the job of the pelvic floor? Like what's its function? Actually, there's a whole bunch of functions of the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor, it, it acts like a little bit of a trampoline. It lowers and rises to help control pressures that are happening above in our belly. It supports our pelvic organs. So all of those organs that sit above the bony pelvis, that the pelvic floor starts to support that. We know that there's a sphincter function. So remember I talked about the anus, for example, it's just the one we're most aware of. So that helps to control defecation and urination. And we also have sexual function of our pelvic floor. It also is important for support of a low back and the hips. There's a strong relationship between low back, hip, and pelvic health. And finally, um, thumb pumps. I need another one I was forgetting. It's like a thumb pump. So it, it, the, that, that trampoline effect has an um, impact on our lymphatic function in that region as oh, well. Wow. Okay. okay. Um, and that's a whole other conversation, but, uh, <laughs> but so th those are sort of the main functions of the pelvic floor, if you will. Okay. The other piece before I know this is a long way to answer your question is I think we also need to talk anatomically about vulva versus vagina. It is a very, very, um, we all talk about vaginas, but the reality is the vagina is actually the internal canal. It's the part that we can't see with a naked eye. Okay. But we always talk about this area that no one wants to talk about as the vagina, right? But the vagina is actually the internal canal. When we talk about the vulva, it's everything that we can see. If we were to hold a mirror up, okay, so I'm going to bring out another model. Sometimes this one makes people a little squeamish, but let's be anatomical here, okay? This is your vulva, okay? This is everything that you can see. So we have our what we call the outer lips or that labia majora, the inner lips, your labia minora, okay, your clitoris your urethra, that's where urine comes out, the opening to the vagina, and, and the anus. So this is your vulva, okay? Okay. These terms are so helpful because this will give us the vocabulary to use when we are articulating if there's discomfort or pain when we're experiencing these menopausal symptoms, dryness, discomfort with intercourse, etc. So while we're talking about pelvic health, it's really everything to do, it sounds like I'm redigesting your words, but the health of that vulva and vagina. Area. Okay? okay. And what we talk about that genitourinary tract. So urinary being, being, um, 
is the bladder, the urethra, the health of that, the urethra is the tube from the bladder to the outside world and the vulva in the vagina. So that whole region. So what that can look like for women who have had gone through breast cancer treatment or going through breast cancer treatment, I would say maybe to answer the question is what the common symptoms are that people come to me for. Yes, exactly. So what are some of the examples? Um, so things like we talked a little bit about pain with intercourse or low libido or complete lack of desire, sexual desire can be one. It can be that dryness, that itching, rashy like feeling, um, or just general discomfort, typically in the vulva region. Uh, we, I can see women who are having incontinence, so urinary incontinence, so leaking pee when they don't want to, right? Uh, whether it be with a cough, a sneeze, um, or for other reasons, it can be um, an increased urinary urgency, which is a really common one. So needing to pee really badly all of a sudden, and sometimes feeling like you're not going to make it, you're not going to keep it together until you get to the toilet. Other reasons I might see someone with respect to pelvic health is bowel health, because that's part of our pelvic health as well. So problems with diarrhea, problems with constipation is a biggie during cancer treatments. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Um, those are, am I thinking about anything else? Those are probably the biggest symptoms relating to pelvic health that we talk about. You know, I've started to hear also in the community, some treatment options include also going through like a hysterectomy or an oophorectomy and things like that. Does that directly or indirectly play into your pelvic health? Oh, for sure. For sure. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's a great question. Yeah. So hysterectomies can be done for a variety of reasons, right? There's different reasons why it might be suggested for, for people who've had breast cancer. Common is oophorectomy, so removal of the ovaries right? And a lot of the times people um, are on some sort of drug to stop the function of the ovaries until they can get that oophorectomy. That's probably the biggest driver. Um, some women might also choose for a variety of different reasons to have the uh, fallopian tubes and uterus removed as well. Okay. And there's different indicators for that. But um, all that to say, we can think about having the ovaries removed is, is um, sort of like surgical menopause, if we want to consider it that way, even though likely you have our, this person has already been put into menopause with drugs. But truthfully, I find symptomatically, actually, some of my clients feel different when, when it's the, because the ovaries are removed versus the drugs because so the side effect of the drugs is no longer there because they're not taking them. So that's been an interesting thing that I've noticed in my practice. Oh. Interesting, because I am one of those people who are on the drugs to right. suppress the ovarian yeah. suppression piece. Um, yeah. And I've been thinking about, do I want to go through the surgery? Do I not want to go through the surgery? So yes, mm -hmm. food for thought. I might follow up with you on what some of those symptoms are. Yeah. And, and I've, I've just seen it in a couple clients now, but yeah. it's definitely been enough of a pattern for me to take pause and go, oh, that's interesting. Um, so I think, you know, some of the things that we blame on, on drug-related menopause or drug-induced menopause actually might be a bit of a blend. Of, hmm. of sort of chemically induced menopause, but also the side effects of the drug. Ah, okay. I can't back that up with science, but I've, it's, it's definitely, I've seen it enough that it makes me kind of think. Yes, for sure. Um, but getting back to your question about consequences for the pelvic health. So there's the, the hormonal piece, which is still there, which is really important. Um, but then there's also, we know that with um, a full hysterectomy, so not just the ovaries, taking out the uterus, there is an increased risk of something called prolapse. Okay, you're introducing a new term here. What is prolapse? It's a fancy word for structures bulging into your vagina, to be blunt. Okay. okay. So if we think mm -hmm. about, here's your pelvis from the side view. Okay. Closest to the front, we have your bladder. In the middle, we have your uterus. At the back, we have your, your rectum. Okay. Okay. So if, if when the uterus is removed, because the uterus is attached to the top of your vagina. So we, we are, some women are at an increased risk of getting bulging of the bladder into the vagina or the rectum into the vagina or the top, what's called, um, well, the cervix, or it depends on if the cervix is still there, but we'll just say the top of the vagina bulging down. 
So there is an increased risk. Um, doesn't mean you're going to get it. So I don't want you to panic. And that should not be a reason not to have hysterectomy if you need it for, for medical reasons. Uh, but just to be aware, because seeing a pelvic health physio proactively can be really helpful just for a few sessions to understand your specific risks and um, and just some sort of maximizing your pelvic health so you're not sort of putting too much pressure on those structures to increase the risk. I really appreciate you just like sharing because I think sometimes too, and even proactively, right? Like when you're in the midst of needing to make some of these medical decisions, you don't have the time to process everything or the longer term implications of some of the procedures you're going through. I know I certainly haven't. And I was like, oh, I wish I had known. And I'm like, well, I'm sure they told me it just went in one ear, not the other. And so, you know, for us to start talking about, oh, I had this procedure done, um, here are some of the things that I could have proactively done to strengthen those muscles or to even know and weigh the pros and cons. So I appreciate that. It's kind of information dumping. Hey, when you're, when you're trying to make these decisions, sometimes in, in a pretty tight period of time, it can be pretty overwhelming and you're really trusting the people telling you the information and they're doing their best to give you the best information. But, you know, again, whole person wise, um, sometimes there's just pieces that women say, gosh, I wish I'd known about that sooner. Not that it would have changed her decision, but just, it would have given her a bit more power. Yeah. To choose whether or not he or she wants to be proactive or, um, or at least have that information. So if a problem arose, they could get, get help sooner. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to like fast forward now, right? So like, these are like all the things that I wish I had known, right? Or yeah. for those of us, <laughs> all the things that we wish we had known. Right. Um, and so let's say we're on the other side and we have all these symptoms and we're like, is it too late? Can we reverse any of these symptoms? Is it possible to get our libido back? Is it possible to change any of these things? Um, you know, what, what should we do? What, are, what would the next steps be in terms of understanding because I've never really, again, prior to these conversations, never thought of my pelvic health as being sick or not well, right? But then now yeah. all of a sudden I'm like, oh gosh, there's a lot of dysfunction happening. So how right. can I, you know, treat it the way, you know, I take care of my dental work or take care of my skin or other mm -hmm. areas of my body? Yeah. I, I love that comparison because I use that comparison a lot. You know, we routinely go to the dentist. Why aren't we routinely seeing a cancer rehab physio, routinely seeing a pelvic health physio just for a check-in? And yeah, I'm good. Okay, off I go. I, to Perfect. I totally agree with that philosophy. So first of all, it's never too late. Never, never, never too late. So there's hope, hope for us. There is okay, always <laughs> hope, always hope. And second is you are normal. And I think that's really important to highlight is that, um, what you, along with anybody else, um, I use the term women, and I, I'm not trying to be um, gender specific when I say that part, my apologies if anyone's listening, it's just the, the wording I'm going to automatically today for some reason. But as you know, any woman who's gone through breast cancer treatment, this is a really high likelihood that this is going to happen. If, if you've had an, a, a hormone dependent cancer, okay, a breast cancer, it's, it's, it's likely going to happen. And we know that if you are on an aromatase inhibitor, uh, what's the stat? It is, I think you are nearly at double the risk, double the risk of developing some of these symptoms as compared to somebody the same age as you who hasn't, isn't on aromatase inhibitor. So, so this is normal, right? This is normal for women who are going through breast cancer treatment, normal. In terms of what you do, um, I think there's things that you can do completely on your own. And then getting the help of a pelvic floor physio can be really helpful as well. Okay. I often suggest even to start um, the basic things that we can do, because we know vaginal dryness, vulvo vaginal dryness is really common, really, really common. So basic self-care, stop using soap on your vulva. If you're using it, soap is extremely drying to the vulva. And uh, if you're already dry, you can imagine what that's doing to those tissues, right? So if anybody's listening to this and using soap, please stop. Just use water, okay? Um, water in your fingers. You don't need to friction or rub, just a little bit of water. Give your vulva a rinse, good to go, okay? The other one is if you're using douches in the vagina, please stop. There's lots of harsh, harsh, rough chemicals in those things. Our, our vag, our, we, we talk about a vagina like a self-cleaving oven. So we don't need douches. It's um, a beautifully created industry, but it's completely unnecessary. 
Uh, and in this situation, it can be really irritating. So right off the bat, if you're using soaps or douches, stop. That will help right off the bat with some of these, this dryness, these issues. Other things, things we, we can do like right away, like right in away, our control. right? Mm-hmm. So hopefully if anyone's listening, because I'll be on, I will be honest. I'll say this on, on a podcast that's going God knows where, but before I had my pelvic health training, I used soap in my vulva. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hold Absolutely. on. Absolutely. And then I stopped. And after a couple of weeks, I went, oh, wow. I didn't even know that was a little bit dry. Right. Right. So, um, mm-hmm. th- these are just simple things that aren't necessarily common knowledge to everybody. Mm-hmm. Other things are, um, they're general comments, but they're backed in the literature about trying as much as you can to stay physically active, because that also helps with blood supply to our body, including our pelvic floor, eating a well-balanced diet. Um, so I won't get into that. That's a whole other conversation, but, and then as well, smoking, smoking has been linked, um, to vulvovaginal atrophy, which is sort of thinning of those tissues. So if you are a smoker, as best you can, I know it's not easy to say that, but, uh, or to do it, I should say, but stopping or at least decreasing uh, cigarette smoking definitely can can make a big difference to those tissues. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I remember reading that study and going, oh, that's, that is interesting, right? So it's not just this general stop smoking, but there actually is some evidence to back that up. Mm-hmm. Other things you can do without seeing anybody, though I'm actually going to put the caveat in, if you have these symptoms, I think it's important to see somebody to be assessed because there's other reasons dryness can happen, which are not as um, innocent, shall we say. So sure. I think it's important just to be, to have an exam either by your family doctor, or if you're fortunate to have a pelvic health physio. Nonetheless, um, moisturizers, just like we moisturize our skin external skin, our vulva and our vagina are no different. So there are over-the-counter products. You do not need a prescription. They do not have estrogen in them that can really make an enormous, and and I, I I can't stress this enough, an enormous difference to the health of those tissues, to the moisture of those tissues and how they feel. Okay. So I have, um, a, a list on my website. I, I know we talked about this. I'll give you the link so you can post it with, with uh, however way this is going to be delivered. Um, because just like everything, they're not all made the same, right? And some of these moisturizers have products in them that I wouldn't want to put in my body, especially if I have had a history of cancer. So there are certain products that we do sort of recommend staying away from. Some of the evidence is low level, but I am uh, meaning that it's, we don't know hundred percent for sure, but we've got some suspicions. And my opinion is if we have some suspicions and there are other products that don't have those ingredients, why, why, why would we use them? doesn't make sense to me. Right? So the problem is it's really not always easy to get the information to make an educated and informed choice. So I got really sick of writing them down for clients on sticky notes. So I finally, I finally made this handout and put links and put links to where people can Mm -hmm. buy them. um, So that, so that you can go at it. I'm not saying these are the only ones because they're not, there are other ones out there and U S versus Canada. There's, there's some different ones out there for sure, but nonetheless, this is just a great place to start. Yeah, a starting point into like understanding like what is even out there. I know when I'm searching for something, I'm very cost sensitive. So Mm -hmm, like I could just purchase like the cheapest one, not knowing that there's like full of estrogen or other products that could be really toxic and harmful for me. So at least kind of understanding where to begin and that there's a, you've already done some vetting for us, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm, So -hmm. we have that starting platform. Absolutely. Yeah. So what you're going to notice if you, if you pull this hand out is that all the Volvo vaginal um, moisturizers that I recommend have an ingredient called hyaluronic acid, HA. Okay. And what hyaluronic acid has been known to do shown to do is to add moisture and keep it there as long as possible to the tissues. And that's what we want. That's what we want to add moisture to those tissues. Okay. The other thing that we know is, um, that some other ingredients that are in some of these moisturizers actually can do the opposite effect and kind of pull without getting complicated, pull tissues, pull stuff out. So 
hyaluronic acid, it really is a bit of the secret sauce for your for these moisturizers. Uh, really, really important. So you'll notice that if you're looking through the list, that's why. Okay. And and what we know from the research from the North American Menopause Society, from ACOG, oh, I always get there, the um, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. Um, so those two resources, the recommendations are for anybody who has a history of breast cancer, the first line of treatment for vulvovaginal dryness is hyaluronic acid-based moisturizers. Okay. So that's where it's coming from. Wonderful. Okay. If that's not enough, um, and that's a whole other conversation about what that means, but we'll just keep it simple for now. If that's not enough, then the conversation around topical estrogen or to uh, comes into play. So a cream, not a patch or an oral medication. Um, it, it is, it has been shown by, uh, I think by NAMS, North American Menopause Society, that for some women, it is safe. It is safe to take. Okay. And it's not a first line, but if hyaluronic acid isn't enough to alleviate whatever the symptoms are, then the conversation around for you as an individual is vaginal and vulvovaginal estrogen a safe option for you. And for a lot of women, it is because there is very limited absorption of the hormones into our bloodstream. I'm going to leave it. I know there's going to be people who are going to disagree with me on this. It's, um, but this is backed by science. And I bring this up because I don't think we should all be knocking on our oncologists and gynecologists door after breast cancer saying, I want vaginal estrogen. But I think it's important to understand that this is not absolutely off the table because you've had breast cancer. And that is new science coming in because we've had a few decades of, of, um, misconception about about the use of vaginal estrogen yeah and i think you bring up the really important point of it's a conversation mm -hmm. it's you know kind of figuring out it's those pros and cons i know people who have stopped taking um aromatase inhibitors and it was a conversation because the side effects were too yeah. too hard and impeding with their their quality of life and so i think there's so many factors um and also your own personal comfort level of absolutely you know what what are you going to feel most comfortable in when you wake up every morning, knowing that you are making the best decision for yourself? Mm -hmm. To me, that's like my barometer, right? Like if I have gone through the pros and cons and everything and have that, I think as women, we have our superpower of that gut feeling totally and agree. we know that we're making the right decision, then yeah. that's all that matters. And that's, what's really important to us. Absolutely. And then, yeah. So I think that's wonderful. Uh, one, one question I had about the, um, so the moisturizers, you were talking about alleviating some of the the symptoms. So that would be like the dryness, the irritation, the itchiness, potentially. Mm -hmm. Does the moisturizer also um, help with the atrophy that comes with menopause? Uh, to a small extent, yes. Okay. Um, I think maybe quickly backing up, a term I didn't actually throw out at the beginning with the alphabet soup was the term genitourinary syndrome of menopause, GSM for short. Okay. And what that is referring to is all of these changes in the vulva, the vagina, and the genitourinary tract. Okay. So that, that whole package and internally the urethra. Okay. Um, I lost your question again. Isn't that no. funny? Well, I just think it's so interesting <laughs> because, you know, when I was going through and, you know, I use a lot of I statements because I can't be so general about everyone, but when I was going through all of this, um, and I lost my estrogen cause I was triple positive in my breast cancer diagnosis. I thought I was just getting older, but like literally mm -hmm. because you're thrown into menopause, like your skin, like your neck skin, your, Absolutely. like everything just kind of gets older and mm -hmm. dry. And mm -hmm. like, I was like, am I aging at warp speed? But I kind of am because of the chemical reaction. Right. You and got so it. I think about that also in terms of like, okay, is it too late to reverse some of these side effects or how can I help at least slow them down so that, you know, I, I don't get old too quickly. <laughs> Well, and, and maybe I, I'm digressing a little bit, but to, to jump off of that is estrogen has an enormous, I think it's like, I think it's somewhere around over 50 functions in our body, 50, like a huge number of functions, right? Brain health, heart health, bone health, pelvic health, skin health, da, 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 da. there's so many things that estrogen does to keep our body healthy. So when you remove that, 
at the flick of a switch, that's going to have consequences, right? And I mean, we're just talking about the pelvic consequences today. And I know we're, we're I'm kind of going all over the place in this conversation. So hopefully it's not too no, much. No, no, no. This is, I mean, this is but, diving into everything. That's yeah. what we do here. <laughs> so when we, when we circle back to that, that concept of GSM, we're not just talking about the vulva and the vagina. Because I talked about some of those urinary symptoms, right? Yes. And actually a symptom I didn't mention is repeated urinary tract infections. Okay. okay so that, that's huge. so more, more than two to three a year. Like it's, it's really common, right? Um, so all of these, basically, if anything down there is just feeling different, you're normal. It's important to understand that you are not alone in this and there is help out there. I think those are the important things to remember and understand. And there are things that you can do to help. And it's, um, you're not, um, you don't, what's the right wording here? Um, you've got more control than you think. I think, again, I think if we can think about or more power than you think to, uh, to manage these things. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So my next question is, and I appreciate you kind of helping us again with all of the terminology, but can you tell us a little bit about the difference between moisturizers and lubricants? I think mm, sometimes we use yeah. that interchangeably, right? Um, yeah, you're right. I, I get sort of like vulva and vagina. Exactly. <laughs> Rises of lubricants sort of get. get they're right next to each other on the shelf too. So you don't know which one to get. And, and, yeah. 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 And there, and there is a big difference. So that is a really important, important thing to talk about. So when we talk about lubricants, because I think that's probably the thing most of us have heard of before, right? Is lubricants are designed for, to decrease friction uh, for short periods of time. So functionally, what we're really using lubricants for is penetrative sex. Um, so any any penis, dildo, anything that that you're inserting into vagina or anus, um, a lubricant can be very helpful to decrease the friction. Okay. So short term use, whereas vulval vaginal moisturizers, I'll just say moisturizers for short. Moisturizers, as we just talked about a few minutes ago, are for longer term use. Okay, so they take, they don't get sort of soaked up quickly. Um, they're there to keep moisture in the tissues over a longer period of time. So they're very different things. Um, I have had quite a few women come into my clinic saying they've used a lubricant as a moisturizer and it doesn't work, right? Like, it, no, it didn't work. And so when we dive into, we're like, ah, that's because that's a lubricant. Okay, that makes sense, right? When we sort of figure out what they've actually been using. Good intentions just didn't understand the difference, right? So that's the difference. Um, lubricants, we already talked about moisturizers. So lubricants, there are three types of lubricants, if you will. We have water-based types of lubricants, oil-based lubricants, and silicone-based lubricants. This is going to be my next question. Ah, yes, I uh, jumped into it already. No, I love it. That's perfect. I was like, okay, help me break this down because again, I'm just picturing myself like looking at the pharmacy line of like, I don't even know where to begin. And then I get embarrassed yeah. because like someone walks behind me and I'm like, oh God, they know. And so right. then I run away and don't even buy anything. So that's what happens in my situation. Fair. And I feel your pain, been there. And so were so many of my clients, which is why, again, I created a handout because I actually feel like this one is even more poorly misunderstood. Okay. And there is so much garbage out on the market for sale that I would never put in my body ever. So um, this to me is one of those big passion projects of mine as well is or surrounding pelvic health is, so let me back up. So we've got those three types, um, water-based or no, let me back that up. Silicone and oil-based, the pros of them, they tend to last, they last longer. So if you're the type of person that your intercourse or playing with whatever sex toy is going to be longer, then those people may prefer a silicone or, or an oil-based. I The downfall to them, they can stain your sheets. So that's a reality. <laughs> um, and they're not safe to use with, um, oil-based isn't safe to use with condoms with dildos, sex toys, they can start to break it down. Okay. So, and I do find clinically that my caseload, remember I'm working with people who have genital urinary syndrome of menopause, right? I'm not working with, with, um, I'm working with low estrogen women, shall we say. 
I find that that group, there's more women that tend to get their tissues get irritated. I just find that clinically. So I tend to recommend water-based. Okay. Uh, and, and water-based, um, doesn't last as long, but it doesn't stay in your sheet. You can use it with condom. You can use it with toys. Um, here's the big butt. And this is my soapbox that I'm getting on here. I'm getting ready. All right. Is there's something called, I don't want to get too complicated, but there's something called osmolality. Okay. And what that has to do with keeping it simple is the ability to, I always get it backwards and I describe it. So I might get it backwards, but it has to do with how, whether the product pulls moisture out of tissues or delivers moisture to the tissues. Okay. And without getting complicated, there's a threshold that the World Health Organization has set from a safety perspective. Okay. And what they have said is ideally, get ready for this. So ideally, any lubricant, osmolality should not exceed 380 milliosmoles per kilogram. We'll just say 380. Okay. But there are so few products on the market that meet that criteria that it's been increased. The recommendation of acceptable is nothing more than 1200. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's driving me crazy. Right. Now, not, not what who is that? Like the World Health Organization. No, no, no. Again, but it's that's like, not wait. the piece that drives me crazy. What drives me crazy, there are so few products on yes. the market. That, I know. That's that like backwards. Just like go yeah. out and create your product. Where's my product manager and my right. like entrepreneurs right. out there solving problems? <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on. And they exist. They exist, right? Yeah. But but they're not those aren't the ones that line the shelves. Right. Right. They're very you have to search hard. And to go on a box, it doesn't give you what the osmolality is on a box. It's not there. So you have to okay. go digging through websites. And I even had to email a few companies to say, what is your osmolality? Or what is your pH level? Because that's the other piece we have to consider with lubricants. Our vagina has a normal pH level, right? So that acidity base, go back to chemistry in high school, right? We have a normal acidity level. And um, so it's different before menopause and after menopause. So we'll say sort of post-menopausal women, it sits somewhere around 5.3. Before menopause, it's sort of 3.6 to 4.5. Just, I know some people listening to this probably like numbers. So I want to give you those numbers. So when we're picking a, a lubricant, we want to try and pick something that's pH matched, right? So we're not irritating our tissues. Um, and again, a lot of these lubricants don't fit in those ranges, right? There's more that do than osmolality, but they don't. And those numbers also aren't on our boxes at, at the stores. Ah, does that not drive you crazy? That does. <laughs> that does. It burns me. Yeah. <laughs> so if if you get nothing else from this talk that you share with someone else, share that stuff, that information. Yes, right? absolutely. Um, like the World Health Organization has put this information on the internet, but again, sometimes you have to search to find it. Um, so and getting getting the right product that matches those is also hard. And again, I got kind of tired of writing stuff on sticky notes. And truthfully, if I don't write stuff down, I forget it. So I was forever searching for clients and giving them the names. So again, I created a handout and I'll give you that one as well. Okay. Um, I am not saying the I am not saying these are the only ones. Um, I I these are water-based lubricants that I typically recommend. Um that meet or are very close to the pH and the osmolality, okay? Because we know that under 1200, according to World Health Organization, is safe. But my thinking is if we can get you closer to that super safe zone, then why not? Right? Oh my gosh, so much information and like the combination of like the moisturizers and then the lubricants if you're, mm. you know, engaging in intercourse or sexual activity, um, you know, just really good ideas and tools to have to make the experience much more pleasurable. Absolutely. Um, right. I think that's wonderful. I mean, I mean, getting, getting back into getting back, if, being in an intimate relationship, whatever that looks like for you, if it involves intercourse, penetration, intercourse, however, works for you and your partner, that that's a whole other unpacking, right? A whole other conversation to unpack with a lot more other people than just a physiotherapist in fairness. 
But I think, you know, these small things that to- if you have that little bit of knowledge of the things we just talked about, then you can make choices. Then you can make choices. It's what, what's right for you um, versus somebody else. And, and with that lubricant choice, I just want to add in terms of how you use a lubricant, because this is a conversation that's come up a lot with my clients too, um, is to apply the lubricant to your vulva and or some lubricants, they come with an applicator and you can actually insert a bit into the vagina and whatever you're inserting into your vagina. So penis, sex toy, whatnot on both sides. Okay. So then you, um, I, I joke and say you can never use too much lube. I guess you can, it can get pretty messy, <laughs> but you know, I would say if you're not used to it, err on the side of too much rather than not enough. So at least when you're beginning until you get to learn your product, because every product's different. Some are liquidy, some are gooey. It just depends. So much brilliant information, Beth. Thank you so much for enlightening us, teaching us all this new vocabulary and putting together these handouts that I will be sure to link to in the show notes of the podcast, as well as on our website, giving you all of the credit for the amazing research that you have done. How can our listeners find you and contact you and stay in touch with you? Yeah, so you can find me easiest way is heading over to my website. So it's www.bethhoguephysio.ca. And I'll give you those links as well. So you have them. So there, I have a lot of resources, free resources on my website. Um, I've got an active blog page with all sorts of information topics. I've got a whole area of free resources, some handouts like the one that the lubricants and moisturizers handouts on there as well. I've got some talks on there. So that's really the, that's kind of my home base. That's the best place to go to find, to get in contact with me um, and the information I provide. Um, I also have an on uh, my very first uh, online program that I have, that I released to help support uh, individuals recovering from breast cancer surgery. So that's also on my website. You can access it there and to get some information about that. Um, because I just, I just want everybody to get this information. I just think everyone should get it and have the support that they want if they want it. Um, yeah. So that's how you can get the best way to get a hold of me. Yes. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. I think for me, I always love to add, um, you know, or conclude with, I should say, like the biggest takeaways, right? Or if there's anything that we haven't discussed that you really think um, we need to discuss before we wrap up, um, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. But one of the things I've heard consistently throughout this conversation is that we're normal. To me, that just super resonates. Like, thank you for validating our experience and thank you for hearing our concerns and for normalizing the conversation so that I just really appreciate Beth it's been such a pleasure and just something that like kind of takes the weight off like I am not alone even though sometimes it can feel very daunting and silent Mm -hmm. yeah I'm glad that resonates with you I think the other thing I would say is that you're not alone you're normal and just because you've been diet you've gone through breast cancer treatment doesn't mean you have to suffer and put up with all the side effects. Uh, that's something I feel really passionate about is that we can't control, we can't control everything. There's some things that are out of our control, but there's a whole lot that we do have control over, but we don't have the knowledge to know how to move forward with that or the skills. So from the context of pelvic health and beyond, <laughs> much more than that, but but there, you have a lot more control than you think, and you don't have to suffer. Amazing. If you're listening to this podcast, I really hope you have so many great takeaways, golden nuggets and resources, and you feel empowered. You also know how much I love hearing from you, our listeners and our SBC community members. So please do get in touch. Send me an email at laura at survivingbreastcancer.org and let me know what your experience is with regards to sexual health and pelvic health in general and how you're doing today. Beth, thank you so much for being on Breast Cancer Conversations today. And thank you all for listening and tuning in week after week here on Breast Cancer Conversations. Please be mindful that all of our content and information is for educational purposes only and is never a substitute for medical advice. 
If you want to hang out, again, please check out survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events, where you can RSVP to our Thursday Night Thrivers weekly meetup, our Movement Monday classes, workshops, seminars, and so much more. We can also continue the dialogue online via social media. Our Instagram handle is survivingbreastcancer.org, all one word, and you can follow us on Twitter at SBC underscore ORG. Until next time, keep on thriving.